Get this and get it straight. Crime is a sucker's road, and those who travel it wind up in the gutter of the prison of the grave. There's no other end, but they never learn. For your enjoyment, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum brings you Raymond Chandler's most famous character in The Adventures of Philip Marlowe. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Here's a taste treat you can enjoy indoors, outdoors, at work, or at play. The cool, long-lasting mint flavor refreshes you. The smooth, steady chewing helps keep you fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Now, with Gerald Moore, starred as Philip Marlowe, we bring you tonight's exciting story, The Face to Forget. All right, all right, wise guy. I told you once you couldn't come up here to this room, Marlowe. That's right, landlord, but I found all I needed. Well, you won't be able to use it after I teach you some manners. Snooper! I'll teach you to break into a respectable room and house. Not leading with your right, you won't. Now get up. Come on, get up. Okay. I'll teach you something about cooperation, landlord. All I wanted to do was look this room over, and I was nice about asking. Cut it out. I, I got my rules. Yeah, and I got a job to do. I've been looking for Dave Stroud for a solid week, and his trail finally led me here. I, I got to look out for my rumor's privacy. Sure, sure. Only Dave Stroud checked out of here this afternoon. He's no longer your guest. Anyway, I found enough in here to know Stroud's taking the train tonight for San Francisco. So that winds up my lecture, and I'm happy to say my business with you and your charming establishment. Good night, landlord. When I stepped out of the cheap, musty rooming house into the warm night, I felt for the first time in a week that I wasn't wasting my time. That by tomorrow I'd know why a quiet young guy named Dave Stroud had suddenly dropped everything that gave life some sense. Everything from a lovely girl to a fine job and vanished. Completely. I stopped in a phone booth, called my client, and told her to meet me in an hour at the Leopard Spot, the bar in her hotel. Then I made a reservation on the 10 o'clock train for San Francisco, went home and threw a toothbrush and shirt into a bag, and when I walked into the Leopard Spot, I was right on time. I found my client, Ellen Wyatt, in a booth near the back. The soft rose lights touching her face made me wonder all over again what kind of pressure it could possibly have been to drive Dade Stroud away from a girl like this. I tried to wait in my apartment upstairs, Phil, but I just couldn't. Is it good news? I hope so, Ellen. <laughs> that broken-down rooming house over in East L.A. paid off all right. Dave was staying there? Yeah, he had been, under the name of Donald Stranigan. Oh, but why would he take a place like that? He must have plenty of money with him. Oh, well, the city's cluttered with those joints. They're as common as tin cans. He figured you can't look into all of them. We were just lucky. Then he knows what he's doing. There's nothing wrong with him like... Like amnesia. No, it's something else, Helen. Oh, good evening, Miss Wyatt. Martini? Uh, yes, please. For you, sir? Martini sounds fine. Yes, sir. Right. Marlo, maybe that hunch I had about gambling, maybe it was right after all. Couldn't some kind of terrible jam with gamblers do this to Dave? Yeah, it might. But I checked that and drew a blank. Say, listen, Ellen, the description of Dave I got at that rooming house isn't too complete. Uh, that snapshot I asked you about, you bring it? Oh, yes. Uh, oh, good. It's in my purse. Uh, uh, oh, here. Uh, that was taken on our first date four years ago. Four years ago? Huh? Those years made quite a change in both of you. Yes. Dave and I are good for each other, Phil. Oh, sure. I, I only hope that the next four here we years... Here are. Martini, very dry. Oh. Oh, thank you, sir. Well, I... I wish we had the kind of news we could toast. Maybe we will. Sooner than you think. You've got a new lead? You know where Dave is? Well, close enough to be pretty sure he's taking a 10 o'clock to San Francisco. San Francisco? Yeah, and so am I. Oh, Phil. How about coming down to the station with me, huh? Me? Oh, but do you think that's wise? What if he saw me first? Well, it's worth a chance for you to point him out to me. What do you say, baby? Got something to drink to now? Yes, and... I'd better do it fast before I start to ball. Tears would be awful in a martini. No luck.
But still, I still haven't seen him. Wait a minute. How about that one, Ellen? Over there at the cigar counter. Wait. Oh, the fellow in the T-shirt? Yeah. Uh-uh. Dave couldn't look that sloppy. And besides, he's taller. Oh. Uh, well, that's it, Phil. Yeah. Well, I guess we missed him. I better get aboard, huh? This kind of scares me. You, you don't think Dave just pretended to be leaving it, that he tricked you? No, no. Those leads weren't planted. They weren't that good. Don't worry, baby. Dave will be on this train when it pulls out. I'll bet my last buck on it. Find him for me, Phil. Sure. You just keep that chin up. I will. Okay. And call me the very first chance you get. Call right. for train 61. Oh, oh. Pardon me, lady. I'm sorry. Hey, you, you have that back. Me? Yeah, just a short minute, my friend. Unless you happen to favor dirty shirt size 17. <laughs> You're in for a big disappointment. What are you talking about? <laughs> well, I think you made a small mistake there. Isn't that my bag? I'm afraid not, mister. C.P. is in Philip, M. is in Marlowe. Well, how do you like that? I saw you pick it up back there at the information booth. <laughs> That's where I left mine. <laughs> I could have sworn it belonged to me. I'm sure sorry. It's all right. It happens to everybody sooner or later. Yeah, well, now that now, mighty uh, big of you, friend. Say, you're going to be on old 61 for Frisco, too, aren't afraid you? Great so, yeah. Well, let's call this an introduction. Arbach's my handle. Manny Arbach, on the road for Pfeiffer Plumbing Fixtures. Yes, sir. I'll see you on board, friend. Not much doubt about that. No, we might get up a little game. Fun, huh? Oh, fine. Yeah, well, I better shake a leg and get my bag. I'll find you, all right. I never forget a face. Maybe I ought to cut my head off. <laughs> I stopped off in my compartment just long enough to drop my suitcase. Then as we pulled out, I moved through the train to the dining car and picked a seat where I could keep an eye on the rest of the tables for Dave Stroud. Who, even if I didn't recognize his face, I knew from his fiance would handle the knife and fork European style. He likely to order liver and bacon and drink tea without sugar. And would probably be dressed in wooded tweeds with the shirt collar open. Well, as soon as I sat down, the car began to fill. My table companion, a quiet tab collar type, had his own business and knew how to mind it. Almost 100%. Which he did for the 15 minutes it took him to eat. Well, I don't know why food always tastes better on a train, but it does. Thank you for letting me share the table with you. Oh, not at all. Uh, perhaps I'll see you later in the club car. We might have a nightcap. Yeah, it's a deal. Fine. Hmm. So long. So long. Oh, hi, so there you are, oh, Marlo. Oh, fine. Hey, I've been looking high and low for you, my friend. What you doing in here? They serve nothing but food in this car, you know. <laughs> Say, who's your pal? I don't know. I don't know. He was here 15 minutes, and we didn't get that far. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. You do? Yeah, those quiet birds give me the willies, too. You know, friend, I've seen him someplace before, and I never forget a face. You didn't catch his name, huh? He didn't throw it. He didn't throw it. Oh, <laughs> you like that, huh? Yes, sir, you're yeah. right on, my friend. Well, it'll come to me. Faces are kind of a hobby with me. I meet a lot of people, but I never forget a... Hey... Have you lost somebody in here the way you keep looking around? Yeah, but I think I found him again. Hey, hey what's up? Where are you going? Play follow the leader. I'll see you, back. Hey, uh, Marlo, come back. You dropped something here. In spite of the fog kicked up by the traveling typhoon who never forgot a face, I'd managed to catch a glimpse of the door of a bunch of tweeds and an open collar on a bill that exactly fit the four-year-old snapshot in my wallet. I bucked a huddle of undecided dodges blocking the aisle, but managed to keep him in sight all the way back to car 16 without being seen. There I watched him unlock compartment L and go inside. I was convinced it was Dave Stroud, but at this point I had to be sure. I went to look for the conductor and finally found him tucked away at a lonely table back in the club car, as intent on his ticket count as a cheat at solitaire. I figured I could afford the time now, so I decided to wait. I headed back for the seat and I ran into my dinner partner. The tab color. Well, hello again. <laughs> You're a little early for that nightcap, but sit down anyway. Thanks. Oh, by the way, I'm uh, Roy Tarney. Oh, mine's Marlowe, Philip Marlowe. Philip Marlowe? Why, I've yeah. read that name many times. You're the famous private detective. Well, <laughs> private detective anyway. <laughs> Glad to know you, Tony. Privilege for me. Oh, are you looking for a match here? Yeah. No, keep them. Keep them. I have others. Oh, thanks. Thanks again. Are you on a case now, Marlo, or, or shouldn't I ask? Well, as a matter of fact, I... Hey, Marlo! Uh, no. Marlo! Man, are you hard to hang on to. But you're mighty lucky mm. I'm honest, my friend. You see this? Yeah, I see. 
It's my wallet. Yeah. When you bolted out of the dining car, you dropped it on the seat. I found it for you. Oh. Nothing fell out but this picture here. And is she all right, man? Oh, man. Who is she, boy? The name, I mean, huh? Don't tell me. I bet you you've seen her before. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, right. I and so. I never forget a face. Uh-huh. Well, thanks. Now, if you let me have it, I'm very grateful. Yeah, and, sure, uh, sure. Glad to be of service, my friend. Oh. Anytime I can... Well, speaking of familiar faces, this is the gentleman that you had dinner with, huh? That's right, Albeck. This is the gentleman. Uh, Mr. Albeck, Mr. Tarney, for better or worse, till your destination do you part. How do you do? Tarney? Tarney, Tarney, Tarney. Now, that's funny. You know, I was just telling Marlowe here that I recognized you from some place. Uh, it's very unlikely. I have a fair memory myself. <laughs> I don't remember you. Well, I don't know. I, I, I'm pretty good. But, uh, hey, wait, wait a minute. I'm getting it. Sure, sure. <laughs> oh, this is silly. Why, I saw you tonight in the railroad station. No, no, that's impossible. I was so late I nearly missed the train. Me too. Only you had a good reason. <laughs> oh, yes, sir, my friend. You were kissing the little woman goodbye. I couldn't see her too well, but she was quite a looker. And judging from the way you were going at it, you... <laughs> Yeah, yeah, well, now, wait a, wait a minute, Fred. I, I didn't mean any offense. I, I was just kidding you along. Yeah, well, I guess I'll uh, go by my way into a little poker. Excuse me. I suppose there has to be one on every train. Yeah, yeah. They help the ride like a square wheel. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think I'll go read a while, Marlowe. Good luck on your case. <laughs> Conductor climb out of his pile of tickets to stretch. I went over, introduced myself, and asked the $64 question. Uh, car 16, compartment L, huh? Well, let's see. Oh, here it is, Mr. Marlowe. That, that room's occupied by one Daniel Stacy. Daniel Stacy? Yeah, sure. Same initials as Dave Stroud. But we're not carrying any Dave Stroud tonight. Don't bet on that, conductor. <laughs> that simple. I walked up through the train to car 16, and when I got to the door of compartment L, I'd already decided on how to handle Dave. I convinced him that he had to go back to Ellen Wyatt regardless of what had happened to him. Yeah, I had it all figured until I heard it. It had come from inside. The door was unlocked, but the lights were out. When I got them on again, I realized that nothing was simple. Ever. Stretched out on the floor of Dave's room was Manny Auerbach, staring straight up as he rocked with the pitch of the train, the side of his head against the sharp steel corner, his eyes already beginning to glaze. He said he knew I'd remember sometime. Remember what? Why did you come here, Manny? He said I'd remember... Manny! Manny! Well, Marlo, it's your move again. Let's see you tell this tale in wires. Who's that? What? Ooh! Oh. To make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, full-bodied, real mint flavor cools your mouth, moistens your throat, freshens your taste. And the chewing itself gives you a little lift, helps you keep going at your best. So for real chewing enjoyment that's refreshing and long-lasting, always keep Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. Healthful, delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum will make every day more enjoyable. Now with our star, Gerald Moore, the second act of Philip Marlowe and tonight's exciting story, The Face to Forget. Either it had been the flat of the pistol crashing against the side of my head, or my head crashing against the stone-hard floor of the compartment. Then it turned light into dark and left me with a welt behind one ear the size and shape of a cue ball. I couldn't tell which. But when I had both my eyes open, I knew that it didn't matter. That nothing mattered really except that I was staring into Manny Auerbach's dead face. While only inches away, a pair of feet were moving. Feet that belonged to Dave Stroud, whose suitcase and toe was on his way out. One hand already on the doorknob. 
I went for him around the knees. Let go! Let go, I say! By the time I I was off the floor and after him, he was well out in front. But wrestling with a heavy steel door at the end of the empty passageway slowed him down. When we reached the platform between the cars, he was almost mine. But then suddenly a hand shot out of the dark, grabbed a fistful of shirt front and spun me hard against the opposite door. No! A hand that belonged to a man in a tab color. Mr. Roy Tarney, plus a shiny 22 automatic, and minus his club car velvet voice. Get up, Marlowe. We've got a little talk coming. At this stage, it'll be a pleasure. Believe me. We'll see. What do you want with Dave Stroud? I'm a census taker who's real... Cut it. Time is running short, Marlowe. When you get off at this stop coming up, you stay off. Yeah? What's your angle? Dave. He still needs my help, and he's still gonna have it. No matter who he kills... Kills? What's that supposed to mean? Manny Auerbach, the chummy one who couldn't forget faces. He's very dead back in Dave's compartment. Well, then, then that loudmouth wasn't just a blowhard salesman. After all, he was what Dave's been running from, one of those lousy card shop. Slips, huh, Tony? Yeah, but they don't count, Mr. Detective. Nothing counts anymore but Dave getting out of a jam that can cost him his hide. Just for the record... That game back in L.A. three months ago that cost Dave every cent he had plus ten grand he didn't was about as level as the rest of that knee pants town ever gets. Which makes you what? Two things, smart Alec. First, a guy from Detroit, a real town, who doesn't like a lousy fix. And second, I like a fix even less when the sucker on tap is my own brother. Now, people, get back away from that door. The station's on that side. I wouldn't want you to run for it and get shot before you got to say a few words. Back over here, Marlo. Uh, take it easy with that gun, huh? They go off, you know. All right, the pitch. Let's have it now. What's Dave to you? Ellen Wyatt. Mean anything? Not very much. But Dave is sorry about that. So when you get back to your client, you tell it... Hold it. Just like you are in state cheerful. This stop, Carter. Carter, gentlemen. Uh, conductor, this, uh, this train wait here a while? I mean, is there any time to get off and stretch? No, sir. Just stop long enough to pick up a little mail, leave a little mail once in a while, take on a passenger. Hardly ever, though, Carter folks aren't much on traveling. Oh, b- by the way, aren't you the gentleman who was looking for Mr. Stacy? Uh, yeah. yeah. I found him, thanks. Oh, don't mention it. Glad to be of service. Say, don't get too close to the edge here, gentlemen. Carter! Carter, California! We, uh, we were talking about Ellen Wyatt, Tony. Why didn't precious brother Dave ever let her know that he had to lay low, that he was in a jam with gamblers? A bunch of roses with card and clothes could have gone a long way, or again, there's the telephone. Oh, button that up, Marlowe. I don't know any of the details. Maybe the kid didn't want to know he couldn't stay away from the pasteboards. Maybe he just didn't want it to worry. Anyway, that's not the point. Then what is? That a broken heart beats a broken skull seven times a week. You should know that much, Pete. So? So I don't want you, the girl, or anyone else to know where Dave is heading. At least not until I get back to L.A., buy my lonesome, and call a few spades just that. Like they do in Detroit, maybe, huh? Like they do in Detroit, no, maybe. You tell the Wyatt, babe, I'll look her up then. Now you get over there at the door and you take your choice. Jump or get pushed? Jump, pushed, or shot. Go on, Marlo. This is where you get off. <clears throat> Go on, the longer you wait, the harder it's going to be. Name it. Jump, push, or shot. I couldn't say much for the alternatives. But one look back over my shoulder at the gaping 22 automatic level at my head and Tony's ice-cold gray eyes above made up my mind for me. Jump, it had to be! Oh. I, w- I would always remember one thing about Carter, California. The right-of-way was more sand than stone. I... I was grateful. Uh, Carter Station, Willis Hensett speaking. The limited left ten minutes ago. No, no package for you, Miss Lillispan. I'm sure, sure, I'm sure. Huh? Me snapping at you? Now listen, Miss Lily. Yeah, brass of some people. 
Hey, what happened to you, son? I tripped. Dad, this is important. Can you tell me where the limited stops next? Well, is anybody getting on at Murdoch Corner? No, no, no. The first real stop. A good-sized town. Uh, let's see. Smoke cigar, son? No, no, no. Thank... Look, Dad, this counts. Now, come on. Tell me, will you? Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, now, uh, there's Fulton. That's a half-hour wait. Oh. Uh, you got a match, please, son? Oh, yeah, here. Yeah. Here's a whole book. Keep Now, tell me, how far is Fulton? 40, maybe 50 miles. Up grade on the road. How can I get there in a hurry? I gotta catch that train. Well, uh, if you got a car, you can. uh, Where can I rent a car or get a cab? (laughs) It's just yours. Not a chance, honey. Oh, excuse me, Jake's calling from Bakersfield. He's uh, he's expecting a grandchild. All right, for Jake. Now listen to me, Dad. There's a dead man on the limit and this killer as well, and I was tossed off a train. Now let's take the business. What? Well, 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 in that case, let's call ahead and get the police. No, I don't want that. Well, uh, why not, son? Because for one thing, the killer may have been justified. Self-defense and the sight of the law will toss him into a lot of panic. He'll only end up in more gunplay. And for another, I have a very personal axe to grind. Uh, Getting tossed off the train, huh? Yeah, among other things. Now, will you tell me that coupe out there? Is it yours? Yeah, but I can't let you take my car. You're a stri... Cash? Cash. Here. Also, here's my credentials. I'm a private detective out of L.A. I'll get uh, your car back to you as soon as possible. I'll pay you another 50 when I do. Uh, now, give me the keys, will you? Yeah, Quick. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 okay. sure. Here, here, here. It's one in the middle. Thanks, Dad. And don't worry. I'll drive real care... Re- oh, oh, what's the matter, son? Well, you're staring like you don't feel so good. What is it? Uh, your head, maybe? Yeah. Yeah, my head, maybe. I ought to have it examined. Sometimes it's real slow coming up with the truth. The truth? What do you mean, son? I mean, I got a big fat hunch, a hunch that may be able to stop a second murder. If I make it to Fulton in time. So long, Dad. Thanks a lot. You've been a great help. My apologies and congratulations to Jake. Like the station agent himself, Willard Hansen's coupe was a little less than spry. But with the accelerator jammed hard to the floor and only a straight, empty highway ahead, I managed to keep it at a straining 70 most of the way. And 50 minutes later, when I tore into Fulton and followed the street markers to the station, a long, low, welcome sound in the night told me I was on time. The train was just getting underway again. I slammed to a stop at the end of the depot, piled out of the coupe and started to run for the last car. But I changed my mind. The train could chug on its merry way without me. After all, it was going without Dave Stroud and his big brother. Two men were walking down the deserted platform toward me. I slid back into the shadows of a pile of crates and waited. My hand tight on the 38 in my pocket, suddenly positive that my hunch was now a sure thing. Roy Tawney was not Dave's brother, but he was the one who had murdered Manny Auerbach in car 16, compartment L. And he was ready to try murder again. All right, Stroud, that's far enough. Hold it there. Tawney, you're out of your mind. You've got no reason to kill me. I'll never say anything. Ellen knows that. That's why I ran. I could never turn Ellen over to the police. I I love her. Oh, yeah, sure. You're nuts about it. You got lots of reasons to be, haven't you? Reasons like Ellen crossing you up for me and a tall stack of dough. Reasons like knowing that we're both responsible for knocking off our ex-boss to come into that dough. Sure, kid, you got lots of reasons to love her. But, Tarney, I tell you, I do. I ran away, didn't I? Oh, but of course, Mr. Stroud, of course, you ran so that you could wait for a smart time in a smart place to try blackmail. No, no, that's not it. I ran because I love Ellen. Because whatever she's done has been your fault. Oh, oh, no, kid. You've got it all wrong. The lady was the pilot all the way. Even to hire a lousy peeper named Marlow to tag you so that I'd know where to get my hands on you. The, the man on the floor in my compartment? The dead man? That was a loudmouth salesman with a memory for faces. He would have spoiled everything if he'd remembered that he saw me with Ellen in the railroad station and passed it on to Marlow. I had to shut him up and then give the peeper a big cock and bull story about you being my brother and in hot water with gamblers. And Marlowe was the other one, the one who grabbed for me. That's right, Stroud. That was Marlowe. Too bad he didn't grab better, isn't it? Yeah, perfect what? shame, Tony. Well, you dirty little... Oh, oh, shut up! He's got gun! Next two of us! Rotten bitch! Is he... Is he dead, Marlowe? Yeah, Dave. Even in Detroit, he'd be called dead. Come on, Dave. We got some telephone calls to make. The police, for one. All right. Marlowe, is all this really true? Yeah, I'm afraid so, Dave. 
girl you wouldn't turn in for murder wanted to murder you. Believe it, kid, all at once. It'll be easier later on that way. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Marlowe, for getting here when you did. You saved my life. Well, not exactly. A guy named Willis Hansett gets part credit for that. A guy who runs a railroad station at Carter, California, and also smokes cigars and yeah, sometimes runs out of matches. <laughs> what does that have to do with it? Everything, Dave. See, Hans had needed a light, and I gave him a book of matches that Roy Tony had given me earlier in the club car. I hadn't noticed them then, but I did when Hans had used them. They came from the leopard spot, Dave. The leopard spot? Yeah. The, the cocktail lounge at Ellen's hotel? That's right. And I couldn't buy Tony's having them as just coincidence that tied him into Ellen too tight. A hunch said so. Wait here, will you, kid? I'll only be a couple of minutes. I've got a long-distance call to make before we get in touch with the police. To Ellen? What are you going to tell her, Marlowe? Anything, Dave. Anything that'll keep her right where she is, ready and waiting for what's going to turn out to be the, uh, L.A. police. I won't be long, kid. After the telephone call, Dave and I spent a long hour with the Fulton police, explaining why a man named Roy Tawney was lying in their quiet railroad station face down in a pool of his own blood. And it was a long hour again with the railroad officials who arrived with their own set of questions. Well, it was four o'clock in the morning before we were finally aboard a train heading back for L.A. Dave Stroud and I sat opposite each other in silence through that bleak, empty hour when you can almost feel the day that's coming up nudge the one that's just gone by. I was real glad to see it go. I sat there looking at Stroud and wondered if he'd ever heard the lyrics of a song a train whistle always makes me think of. My mammy done told me. When I was in knee pants, my mammy done told me, son, a woman's a two-face, a worrisome thing who'll leave you to sing the blues in the night. <laughs> Remember, friends, to make every day more enjoyable, treat yourself often to refreshing, delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. There's lots of cooling, real mint flavor in every stick, and chewing Wrigley Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert. You feel better, work better, get more fun out of doing things. So indoors, outdoors, wherever you go, keep some healthful, refreshing Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum handy. To make every day more enjoyable, Treat yourself often to delicious Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum. The Adventures of Philip Marlowe, bringing you Raymond Chandler's most famous character, star Gerald Moore, are produced and directed by Norman MacDonald and written for radio by Robert Mitchell and Gene Levitt. Featured in the cast were Harry Bartell, Sammy Hill, Roy Rowan, Parley Bear, Larry Dobkin, Elliot Reed, and Junius Matthews. The special music is composed and conducted by Richard Arant. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum invite you to be with us next week when Philip Marlowe says... This time I tangled with three snakes. The first was made of gold, the second wore a mustache, and the third was in the bag, and each in its own way, poison. Bob Stevenson speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>